Morning, Glory America, and a great Friday to you. What a remarkable news day. Tragedy, tragedy in Israel. There is amazement on Wall Street at Amazon's earnings. There is joy in Cleveland and Chicago over the NFL draft. There's a crisis in India and South and Central America that is simply hard to get your arms around. There's outrage at racist attacks against Tim Scott, the Republican senator from South Carolina who happens to be black and delivered the rebuttal to President Biden on Wednesday night uh, under a withering attack from the left that is disgusting and repulsive. We'll cover it all. Let me start in Israel, where at least 44 people were crushed to death last night. More than 150 people hurt, including many in critical condition, in a stampede that occurred at a religious mass gathering to celebrate the Lag Amr holiday at Mount Meron. Uh, the rescue service, their Red Cross, the Magdan David Adam Rescue Service, said 38 people have been killed at the scene, dozens more injured. It, it's just terrible. And, uh, you know, immediately when I see dozens dead in stampeded Israeli religious celebration in the New York Times, I think of the, the Who concert in Cincinnati. That's baked into any Ohioan. But it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon for religious ceremonies to have this kind of a disaster attached to it. This annual gathering on Mount Moron, which is in Galilee, takes place near the mystical center of Safed. The Lag Amr holiday is linked in Jewish tradition to the Bar Koba revolt against the Romans in the first century, the end of a plague. Remember in Mecca in 2015 hundreds, maybe thousands making the Hajj were crushed to death or suffocated. In 2013, dozens were killed at a stampede at a train station in Allahabad, India, at the height of a Hindu religious festival that occurs every 12 years by the banks of the Ganges River. So it's, it's a very, very sad a packed, narrow walkway, a slippery metal floor. Uh, details will be all available at timesofisrael.com. Also bad news from the Middle East. Uh, the Palestinian Authority president for life, apparently, Mahmoud Abbas, canceled elections. First time they were supposed to happen in 15 years. They believe in one man, one vote, one time. Meanwhile, after a year, loss in South America is just off the charts. In the capital of Colombia, Bogota, the mayor is warning residents to brace for the worst two weeks of your life. Uruguay now has one of the highest death rates in the world. Grim daily tallies of the dead have hit records in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. Even Venezuela, where the authoritarian government is, according to the New York Times, notorious for hiding health statistics, says the coronavirus deaths are up 86% since January. Last week, Latin America accounted for 35% of all coronavirus deaths in the world, despite having just 8% of the population. Thank God for Operation Warp Speed. Thank you, Donald Trump, for doing that. And the world will be rescued by America, and we will pump that stuff out. In India, Prime Minister Modi, the most powerful Indian prime minister in five decades, is facing a political crisis as his country collapses its health care system. Um, he had a landslide victory in 2019, but the blowback, it's the same as in America. No one in elected office emerges popular after a pandemic. There's not much, I think we will at the end of this say, we did all we could and it's not even enough when a pandemic hits. You can't even come close to stopping it. It's beyond human reach. Only vaccines work. You can't slow the spread. You, you really can't do anything except hide pray, uh, get to therapy earlier, diagnose. My friend Dave Zavagno in Cleveland just bemoans, good, good medical tech professional, that we did not keep early symptoms hospitalized and separated. But you learn, you live, you adapt. Economic news, German GDP contracted in the Eurozone. Germany went down 1.7%. And that's, that's bad. The decline in Europe's largest economy, a reversal from growth of 0.5, came as figures show that Spain dropped a half percent. Italy output fell 0.4 percent. Uh, the good news is that in the United States, well, our stock market, our tech sector, it's almost an incredible 
story. Let me just read you the headline. Telegraph in Great Britain. Amazon. Now, I own Amazon, so I, I'm happy to hear this, but it's news that affects you if you are a stockholder or generally in tech. Amazon shares hit new high as profits triple to $8 billion, says the Telegraph in Great Britain. Amazon's profit run continues bolstered by sustained demand. E-commerce giant's first quarter sales hit, sit down, $108 billion, up 44% from a year ago. The Seattle company's profits, says the Wall Street Journal, in the year since the pandemic started exceeded $26 billion, more than the previous three years combined. Net income from January to March more than tripled to $8.1 billion, and revenue of $108 billion far exceeded the average analyst prediction. A perfect positive storm says the New York Times, not just for Amazon, but for tech. The Financial Times, first paper I uh, read in the West, um, Amazon reaps rewards of pandemic shift online. It's expected to continue. The Amazon advertising business, a relatively small niche in the company, emerging as a big new profit center, up 77% on year-to-year -year, uh, growth to $6.9 billion. Uh, as it continues to leverage its positions as a starting point for searches for most Americans looking for products. Guidance, Amazon very positive. I don't know what the stock's going to do today, but it delivered a huge earnings beat, according to Business Insider, as Jeff Bezos enters his final quarter as CEO. Don't forget, he's going to uh, remain as chairman. And uh, I have no idea what it's going to do today. Could be a rocket. Maybe it was already priced. I don't think it could have been priced in. It's such a huge beat. Twitter went the other way. Twitter shares fell in after hours trading after issuing tepid revenue forecast. Republicans in Florida passed a voting bill that um, reforms the voting in, in, in Florida, much like they did in Virginia, I mean, in, in Georgia. And now we're going to have to wait and see if uh, the crazy woke crowd jumps. I give them a warning, though. I like this story. I found out about it yesterday. Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball, after they got woke and condemned the Georgia voting reform, approval among Republicans had been at 47% of Major League Baseball, highest of the four of the major leagues. It is now at 12% because it was a bipartisan bill that's an important point in a divided America. And Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, should resign. Coca-Cola, the blue soft drink, is suffering and trying to walk back its critique. Delta Airlines, the blue airlines, trying to run away from it. All the woke companies and the woke sports. You know, I watched the draft last night. There was Joy in Cleveland, Greg Newsom, cornerback from Northwestern, a wildcat of whom I regularly engage in a little bit of mockery as my daughter and Guy Benson both went to Northwestern. I love to give the wildcats a hard time because Ohio State just crushes them. But I really wanted this kid, Greg Newsom. Uh, fourth best cornerback, according to everyone else, but Pro Football Focus said he's really number one. And the only thing, that, I mean, the Browns are a complete Super Bowl contending team, and I'm not making that up. That's just true. They got to the final eight, and then Mahomes took them out. But now they got more defenders. They remade their entire secondary. Plus, Justin Fields going to the Bears. The Bears get Fields. I was so worried he was going to end up in the New England Patriots in Bill Belichick's hands. I was fretting, fretting. Didn't happen. Giuliani, Rudy's in trouble. The FBI had warned Rudy that a Russian disinformation tech was targeting a, a campaign was targeting him on Joe Biden, and they raided his they raided his uh, home yesterday. Pretty rare for an attorney-client privilege. Then I played for you yesterday Senator Scott's comments after the uh, State of the Union marvelous speech. Senator Scott gave a marvelous speech. Did not know. He was then attacked by racists for being a racist on the web. It was really horrific, horrific stuff. And uh, I'll play a couple of this when we come back. Here's Sonny Hostin on The View, cut number one, talking about Tim Scott. Um, I was disappointed that he um, said America is not a racist country without also talking about the systemic racism that is plaguing this country. I mean, why was he chosen to give this uh, rebuttal? He was chosen because he is the only black Republican senator. He is that person. He is the person that Republicans want to put out front because of the problem of racism in this country. And he knows that. Uh no, Sonny, you're kind of nuts and dumb. 
He was put out because he authored the police reform, which Democrats block with a filibuster for political reason. The country is not systemically racist. And when you say that, people know the view is just parroting the woke elites and we're tired of it. Coming right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Let me tell you, uh, friends, uh, I was telling you, Tim Scott attacked as racist by radicals and people on TV. This is what Tim Scott said at the end of his speech. Original sin is never the end of the story. Not in our souls and not for our nation. The real story is always redemption. I am standing here because my mom has prayed me through some really tough times. I believe our nation has succeeded the same way because generations of Americans in their own ways have asked for grace and God has supplied it. So I will close with a word from a worship song that really helped me through this past year of COVID. The music is new, but the words draw from scripture. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you. In your weeping and your rejoicing, he is for you. May his favor be upon our nation for a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children. Good night and God bless the United States. Uh, 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 Tim Scott pulled that off. That's hard to do because it's sincere. He's a man of the gospel. He is a genuine believer. Joy Behar, bitter, woke, leftist, representative of the whole crazy left-wing slurch of the Democratic Party said this in response uh, yesterday on The View. Cut 13. Bipartisanship is an obsession with the Republicans right now that Biden is not reaching across the aisle, okay? And yet, when he says, Biden, we're on track to cutting child poverty in half, you look around that chamber and nobody on the Republican side is standing or clapping. Does that mean that they are for child poverty? When he says that he wants clean water and Kevin McCarthy is sitting on his hands and not reacting, does Kevin McCarthy like dirty water? Maybe he should, uh, you know, campaign on that. Dirty water for everybody. As far as and then the other thing I have to say is I thought it was brilliant. I thought Biden was incredibly a warm and, and presidential and just great. And to see those two beautiful, intelligent, brilliant women behind him makes me feel like a real, I just felt wonderful. Now, Tim Scott, he, he, he does not seem to understand, and a lot of them don't seem to understand, the difference between um, a racist country and a systemic and systemic racism. They don't seem to get the difference. Yes, maybe it's not a racist country. Maybe Americans, the majority, are not racist. But we live in a country with systemic racism. We discussed it this week again already about housing and about education and, 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 and all of the things that are important to people. And, um, and, and the fact that Tim Scott cannot acknowledge this is, 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 is appalling. How can you go out there and say that when you just said two minutes ago that you were the, the object and the, vi the victim of discrimination? And then he says that this is not a racist country. At least acknowledge that there is systemic racism. That's what I wanted to hear from him, and he didn't say it. You know, if the acuity had a mailing address, it would have Joy Behar as the addressee. That is about the dumbest thing I have heard on a television show, and I've been in television and radio for 30 years. I would love for her to come on this show. I would be the most gracious host. And I would just ask her questions because if she has opened a book in 30 years, I'd be amazed. I really do not believe she is anything except an accumulation of cliches, which are split out, they, uh, spit out daily by a cliche machine in her office at The View that she reads and then regurgitates. I don't understand how people can attack Tim Scott. This country is not systemically racist. Uh, you, I, I don't blame her for not knowing the fine points of constitutional law, but I, my gosh, make an effort to not be as dumb as a, bro a box of bricks. I'll be right back, America. Market update coming on The Hugh Hewitt Show.
We really should say goodbye to Hollywood on The Hugh Hewitt Show, given the Oscars rating. Joined by the official movie critic of The Hugh Hewitt Show, Sonny Bunch, co-host of Across the Movie Aisle. And uh, he may have been one of the very few people who watched the Oscars. Uh, <laughs> Anthony Hopkins didn't even watch the Oscars. I, I've already done my rant on overproducing, Sonny, on how they guessed wrong and screwed up the show, and it was a terrible day for movies. But in the week since, any other thoughts on the Oscars debacle? Well, I, you know, it's interesting, Hugh. I don't have a, a huge problem with the way the order shook out because, all right. So let me let me just let me just explain what I, what I mean here. So for people who did not watch, which is everyone who was listening to this probably, yes. uh, because the the show did fewer than ten million uh, people in the the ratings. It was a huge disaster, down sixty percent year to year, uh, lowest rated show ever. Um, if you look at, there's an interesting chart that's floating around about the award shows, ratings, the Grammys, Emmys, Oscars, et cetera. Uh, and they're, you know, they're all up and down and they're all kind of in sync with one another uh, from year to year. And what's interesting is that this year they have all kind of converged at a point that is between 9 and 10 million people, more or less. Basically, right in, right in the, all three award shows are right in that zone. Uh, which is which is interesting to me. It suggests to me that there are nine to ten million people out there in the country who watch every award show, no matter what, no matter what is nominated, no matter you know what is what is going on in the world. Uh, so you know, I, I the the Oscar ratings being down this year are not not shocking to me. It's it's a weird year. The the number of movies released is very low. The uh, the quality of movies released, you know, you we we can argue about that. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is nobody had seen them. So yeah, I what I heard on on the Ruthless podcast yesterday, their Hollywood correspondent told me something I did not know, which is that all of the star celebrity women posted pictures of their dresses on Instagram before they walked the red carpet. I mean, isn't that half the deal to see the glamour? And if you've already got it, why watch? Well, I mean, I think that's that that's been going on for for a few years now. I mean, uh, you know, the it's not like people are uh, debuting things on the red carpet anymore. Okay, it's I just, didn't know that. I thought yeah. I thought it was. I mean, new. I, I, like I, I mean, I, it, it, I'm this year was more more in that vein for sure because a there were just fewer stars there because there were fewer people there. Um, but B, you know, I, I do think this has been going on for a little while. But all right, so I am I I will defend Steven Soderbergh and the rest of the producers and their decision to muck about with the order of the show, both in terms of uh, intent and execution. So the intent, right, is we, we basically all knew what was going to win Best Picture and Best Director, right? Chloe Zhao was going to win uh, and Nomadland was going to win. Everyone, everyone kind of knew that was coming. So they wanted to end the, the show on an emotional high note. They were, they, every, people thought, weren't 100% sure, but thought that Chadwick Boseman was going to win. Uh, Chadwick Boseman, of course, died sadly young of colon cancer last year. So, you know, the idea was somebody would come out and give a big dramatic speech for him. Uh, and instead, instead what happened was Anthony Hopkins won in a shock. Uh, the person who was giving him the award, Joaquin Phoenix, is notoriously awkward at awards shows. He hates them. He hates, he hates the whole thing. Uh, and so he kind of just was like, all right, that's the end of the show and kicked its commercials and it, and, and the show just ended. And it was almost like, it was almost like watching a like 1970s new Hollywood movie where the least expected thing happens and it, it is, uh, kind of shocking and dramatic and then it just ends and everything ends. Um, and, and. I actually kind of liked it. I don't know. Maybe this is just no, Sonny, a that's a, me. that's a critic's it's, take. Let me let me give you the, the producer's take. I did a rant. I'm not going to repeat it about this because I've done thousands of live events in my 30 years in broadcast and television and radio. Thousands. And the, the deal is the show is the show is the show. Don't mess with the format. Get to the stuff. Stick with the formula because people expect it. But if you're going to do something that radical, make sure you got your backup plan. Anthony Hopkins, who is 83 years old, Said, I'm not I'm not gonna win. I'm not gonna go to one of your London studios. I'll do it by Zoom. And they turned him down. So they went yeah. to bed. So that is hubris. That's why it ended that way. It would have been a wonderful note. He would have paid tribute to both. I mean, he would have done it. Yes, but 
he uh, the Zoom acceptance speeches for every other uh, Academy type show have been so terrible. I mean, look, I I understand that. I understand that. You know, you want to have a speech to close the night, except. If you let Anthony Hopkins do it, then you have to let everybody else. No, do that's it. not and true. You get sudden, to Anthony sudden, Hopkins is eighty three no, years old. He's no, eighty three no, no, years no, no. old in you COVID. Can't, you can't. You can't start. You can't start making. He, he's afraid of Andrew everyone's Cuomo. Gonna wanna, everyone's gonna want to do it. Everyone's he's afraid gonna want to do Andrew it. So All right, gotta, I got a question for you. Have yeah. you watched Gang of London yet? Uh, I've not. I've not because again, it's on AMC. I don't have. I don't have AMC. You oh, five stars. Okay, what do you reckon? There's nothing for me to see in the theaters this weekend. Nothing. They even well, pulled the you, father. The, did you they pulled see, it. Did you, did you go see Mortal Kombat last weekend, Hugh? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Did I went with my boys, boys, and they uh, um, how, they how said it was nostalgic, and that there are some phrases like, I own your soul, that they found very funny. I thought it was rather jarringly violent, but uh, apparently the game I allowed them to play without much adult supervision um, is that amazingly violent? And there's, I mean, if you've seen the played the game, they they enjoyed it. And I just thought some of the uh, it didn't make a lick of sense to me because they never had the like you said last week they never had the tournament. A Mortal Kombat tournament in a Mortal yeah. Kombat movie. So how is that how is that supposed to work? It is it is uh, basically as violent as the game. So this is this is true. You you have let them watch. Uh, you know, mind warping or let them play mind warping stuff for years and, 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 and didn't no know because all I wanted them to do was turn it down. I thought it was like uh, Madden P, you know, football, and it wasn't so yeah. bad yeah. on me. Uh, so this this weekend, uh, on Amazon Prime, there's a new movie called Tom Clancy's Without Remorse. Oh, is starring, that this weekend? Starring Michael B. Jordan, uh, written by Taylor Sheridan, who you who reader or listeners may remember as uh, the writer of Hell or High Water. Uh, he wrote Sicario. He wrote and directed Wind River. Uh, one of my favorite working writer directors right now, and of course he does uh, the show Yellowstone, which is like the biggest hit on TV. Uh, you know, so the he's the showrunner on that show. Um, so Taylor Sheridan, I love. He wrote this. Uh, but it is directed not by Taylor Sheridan. It's directed by Stefano Salimo. And Stefano Salimo is an Italian TV director, Q. And let me tell you, the problem with this movie is that it feels like an episode of an Italian TV show. It, huh. is, uh, it is not, it's, slow is not the wrong word. It's, it's an hour and 40 minutes or so, Sam's credits. And it, it moves along the plot pretty, pretty effectively and pretty efficiently. It's not slow. It's just flat and boring and dull. Uh, so the, the movie stars Michael B. Jordan as uh, a, a man, John Kelly, whose family is killed in a, uh, a, a it by the Russians. It's revenge for something that happened in Aleppo um, without getting into too many details. He has to figure out who is behind the killing of his wife, his pregnant, his very, very pregnant wife and their unborn child. Uh, and to do it, he he is willing to go on a murderous rampage. All right, now I I was kind of excited for this movie because I like Michael B. Jordan. I think he was uh, he's very good as Creed in the the Rocky you know adjacent movies. Um, I liked him in Black Panther. He's one of the few good Marvel Cinematic Universe villains. Uh, I I like Taylor Sheridan as as I said. I like the idea here. I like the concept. I like the, the guy, the, the military guy going on revenge for his dead wife. Um, and the, the movie just doesn't work because it is super, it, it's just super boring. It's just oh, flat thank and you boring. Killed it. I'm going to finish Gangs of London because that is Guy Ritchie on television. I mean, it's not Guy Ritchie, but it's just a Guy Ritchie movie on TV cut into 10 episodes. And so I'm going to yeah. stick with that. I have a question well, we got, for you for your... You know, a strange silence ensued. No, I, I have a question for you, Sonny. Very quickly, I was looking at my local movie theater, and there's a movie showing, which I never saw. It's it's old. I want to know why is Scott Pilgrim versus the World in theaters? Oh. Uh, you know, that's interesting. I saw an ad for... They, they had a new Dolby mix for the sound. Uh, so it is one of these movies that is supposed to be pretty good in theaters uh, because it has a really, really good sound mix. Um, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is an Edgar Wright movie. Edgar Wright was the guy who made, uh, he made Hot Fuzz and um, uh, Shaun of the Dead. 
Um, so he's he's kind of a he's kind of a British comedy uh, kingpin um, of sorts. And I uh, I like Scott Pilgrim. It's 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 a little bit weird. Why is it in theaters? It's in theaters to get people back into theaters. You know, Edgar Wright's a big believer in the theater, the theatrical experience. And like I said, it has a new sound mix. I mean, this is a movie that is very obsessed with. Uh, with with rock music and bands, the, the kind of conceit of the film is uh, this guy who was in a band is trying to win the heart of a girl, and to do it, he has to win the battle of a band. Uh, oh, well, I might go see of, that. That's a little bit it, like uh, every other rock and roll movie ever. I like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's kind of it's kind of it's structured as both a video game and it is adapted from a comic book, so it's like super stylized. Uh, it stars Michael Sarah as the titular Scott Pilgrim. Um, so depending on your tolerance for Michael Sarah, I know a lot of people are, are not a big fan of his kind of, you know, say one humor, but I, I like him. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a good movie. I enjoy it. I, uh, you know, I, I, and I do think that it is the sort of thing that will play very well in a big Dolby Atmos, you know. Okay. That's cool. Now, like any that. other, we got a minute left. Did we leave anything out for, uh, across the movie aisle buffs? No, no, not a whole lot. I mean, I like I said, without remorse is the the new big thing, and I'm not I'm not super into it. Uh, you know, you could, you're better off just watching an old Jack Ryan. Uh, when when do the, the when does the pipeline open up? When does the screens fill up? When do they release? You know, you know Top think, Gun Two. I mean, right. I mean, I I think that you mentioned Guy Ritchie. There's a Guy Ritchie movie coming out next weekend, actually, starring. Yes, I'm uh, looking Jason forward to that. Wrath of Man. I'm very very. Excited I love Guy Ritchie. Yeah. I see it next week, and I, I'm a big fan of Guy Ritchie, so I'm I'm looking. Are you forward saying to that. it on a screener? Are, are you uh, going to a critic showing? No, I I am uh, unfortunately just going to be watching it on you know on my laptop or on my TV or whatever. Oh. But, but, but I will say that I have heard from uh, friends back back east in DC, and this is one of the first movies that is being shown you know back in theaters, back in theaters for movie critics. So I will be there. Uh, we will talk about it next week. Sunny Bunch, it is always a pleasure across the movie aisle where iTunes, Spotify, wherever a podcast is, you'll find Sunny Bunch and across the movie aisle. Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. On this Friday, I'm beginning with the former senator from Missouri, Jim Talent, one of this show's favorite guests because he's calm, he's collected, and he's knowledgeable. Good morning, Senator Talent. How are you? Well, I'm fine, you. That was a great introduction. Thank you. Well, let me begin with just your general reaction to an unusual week in Washington that featured a uh, address to Congress, Tim Scott's response, and a lot of politicking thereafter. Yeah, I thought Tim did a really good job in a very difficult position. That's something I would not have done if they'd asked me to do it, give the response to the State of the Union. I thought he was, he was very good. Um, I think the Republicans do need to focus going forward in my opinion, on just pointing out that the Democrats are spending us into bankruptcy, uh, tax increases are going to follow, and we're going to end up with inflation and, I think, uh, a stalled economy. It's just a matter of time. And how bad is it you to add trillions of dollars of debt to the next generation at the same time as we're locking them out of the schools? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's been quite a year for America's kids. Now, you featured a great interview with Mike Gallagher on the one bright spot of this week, which was the Shipyards Act. And I've got a yes. column. I've got a column coming out on Monday. My my old uh, military legislative assistant and I are writing one. That's the first bright spot for America's defenses in a long time. And I congratulate uh, Mike and all the senators and uh, Rob Whitman uh, for sponsoring it. Now, I've got to ask you about it, Senator Talent. I like yeah. $25 billion for the four Navy yards and a few other yards, but the repair facilities in America, uh, talking to our friend Captain Hendricks yesterday, he said, woe is me, this is good, but the repair facilities are not getting what they need if we're going to keep these ships afloat and repair it and out to sea. I would just like to see them triple it and endow every state with a billion dollars from which they can use the interest for defense infrastructure. I mean, really well, endow that. Yeah, you and Jerry are, are certainly pointing out, uh, pointing it out along the right lines, and, and we're going to, we say in our column, they should also set aside some money to add to the shipbuilding accounts to buy a particular class of vessels. We propose uh, two dozen frigates. Look, I'd like to see the Republicans, and, and this could be done on a bipartisan basis, turn a huge portion of this infrastructure bill 
into a defense bill. I mean, and that becomes talking, bipartisan. Then Joe yeah. Biden gets his bipartisan win. Yes. And look, if we're going to spend all this money, let's spend it on something that everybody in Washington involved in national security knows we're going to have to do, which is to build up, in particular, beginning with the Navy, because Indo-PACOM is a maritime domain, as you know, and there's simply no way that we can pursue the, the, the policy that Trump really started. And Biden, to his credit, has continued largely on a strategic level uh, this competition with China. So I would just turn this infrastructure bill into a defense bill. And as but for the fact, uh, but uh, for the yeah. rush to rejoin the JPOA, I, I have no objection to the early Biden foreign policy because it's been modestly confrontational with China. There is a story I wanted to call your attention to to today's Financial Times, Senator Town. Big four auditors squeezed between U.S. and China. That means the big four auditors are living up to U.S. law concerning uh, open and transparent accounting, and China is cheating. And uh, our government has to come to their assistance, I think, because China is cheating, and their books are cooked. Uh, you you pushed a button. I may take the rest of your show this morning and refuse to let, uh, to <laughs> let you end the interview, because we do not. People need to understand, we allow Chinese companies to list on our exchanges when they are not— <laughs> They are not complying with our auditing rules. We don't know what their books say. Yep. And this has gone on for years after year after year. The Congress has ordered them, beginning with Dodd-Frank, has ordered the SEC and the federal authorities to say, look, you have got to get into their books. The Chinese simply won't permit it. And so, yes, the auditors are, the, the, the auditing firms are caught because the Chinese government won't let them do what the United States government says they have to do. And the answer is simply, well, then you can't list on our exchanges. Yeah, the There's Financial the Times story reads, the clash has left the big four global accounting firms, Deloitte, PwC, KMPG, and EY, which have spent three decades building large operations in the Asian country, trapped between antagonizing Beijing or incurring penalties elsewhere, it is the latest challenge for the big four firms, which have faced mounting criticism over their audit quality controls in the wake of frauds by Wirecard, Luck and & Coffee, and others. They have been threatened by regulators who want to rein in their oligopolistic practices and their global business models. They ought to be sued, Jim Talent. If they're uh, not going to do it, they ought to be sued. Right, and I, I tell business leaders all the time, because they all, and I understand it, you know, they got this big market in China they want to appeal to. They're, they're going to get caught. This competition is going to continue. It's going to continue at a, high, at a higher level, and they're going to get caught between these two governments just purely from a business proposition. They need to reevaluate whether they want to do all this business in China. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, it's got a very risky environment for them. And Do you remember you know, the, the Sopranos? I don't know if you ever watched the Sopranos, Senator Talent, but they always had auditors who, you know, they were cooking the books, right? They were hiding the money. They got to they got to launder the money. That's what they're doing. They're just helping mm -hmm. China launder their money and hide their debt. That's right. And the chickens are going to come home to roost at some point. I mean, again, we have regulations, uh, you know, the the uh, the accounting people, the SEC that our companies have to follow in order to be public. In order to be listed on the exchange, the Chinese simply won't do it. They won't let us look at the, the auditors look at their work papers. In other words, you have to take the figures that they give you. And then they're listed on the exchanges and people buy them and invest in them thinking that they're regulated the same way other companies are, not just in the United States, around the world in terms of their auditing reports. And they're not. Boy, the yeah. SEC should crack down on that. They really should. I mean, they should just bar them from doing business with China, which brings me to the last foreign affairs story. Javad Zarif indicates he had no knowledge of covert Israeli strikes before former Secretary of State Kerry provided him with the information. New details that contradict the State Department's recent defense of Kerry. Uh, quote, Kerry told me that Israel had launched 200 airstrikes against Iran, Zarif. You didn't know, asked his interviewer? No, no, he replied. This story either is exploding or going away. Which one? Uh, well, you know what, you It's hard to tell at this point because now what's happened is I would say it's more likely to explode, I would guess, because now the State Department's credibility is also on the line because they backed up Kerry and said, look, this was all public source. You know, the problem is, and you mentioned it in your interview with Oren, with, uh, with Ambassador Oren, you know, the issue here is, is P Kerry thinks you can build a, a lasting Middle Eastern peace 
around a partnership with Iran. It's one of the craziest things that I've ever heard of, but that's what he thinks. And so he's treating Iran like it's an ally. Uh, and, you know, we saw what happened when, when Obama tried to do that. Trump has achieved a peace in the Middle East in part uh, by he rebuilt the coalition by opposing Iran. But, you know, it's like, a, let's oppose our enemies. Uh, why don't we do that? So if you yeah, if I, you read this book, Red Line by Joby Warwick, I interviewed him for an hour for my podcast, the interview. I hope you listen oh. to it. It is the most devastating indictment of Team Obama, including John Kerry and the whole team inside the White House and its state. It breaks your heart. 500,000 dead Syrians. Everything we did was wrong for eight years in Syria, Jim right. Talent. That's Everything. True. Everything. Uh, and, so last and, question. And not, and they not, not only managed to screw up that part of the world, but completely undermine American credibility by the way they handled uh, in the rest of the world by the way they handled the whole red line issue. That's yeah, it, and that's what the book is. It's not a partisan book. It's Joby Warwick, two Pulitzers, Washington Post. So i got to ask you about the tax package. I don't think this gets through because stepped-up basis because of capital gains, because we have a recovery underway and the, the economy is fragile. What are they thinking? Have the Democrats lost their mind politically? They're like sacrificing district after district in homage to AOC and the squad. Yeah, I'm waiting for some of the people in the reddish and purplish district to say, uh, I'm not. I'm talking about in the House, yep. and I'm not going to keep voting for this stuff. But, you know, they did the same thing in 2009. I mean, they, they all went, uh, uh, the, the speaker, <laughs> i got to give her credit. I mean, she pushed them to vote for all this stuff, and then they took a bath in 2010. So, I, you know, I'm waiting, particularly now in the taxes. You're right. Stepped-up basis, capital gains tax increase. And, by the way, you... When they try and increase the death tax, go back and look at the numbers. They never collect more money. I mean, they assume that people are not going to change their behavior when they change tax uh, rules. And, of course, and that the, doesn't happen. People simply the, plan around it. Yeah. And the blue state Democrats are insisting on the return of state and local income tax, which will create a two-tiered system. The blue, t the blue states will be winners and the red states will be losers. Well, I, uh, you know, maybe I think everybody's going to lose under this. You know, you're spending enormous amounts of money raising taxes. What do you think happens to the economy? I mean, I, yep. we'll see. In 2022, they are asking for a red wave. Again, another one. Jim Talent. Follow him on Twitter at Jim Talent with the Bipartisan Policy Center. One of the smartest guys around town. I'll be right back, America. My number is 1-800-520-1234. What do you think of the week that was? 1-800-520-1234. Connection to the Hugh Hewitt Show. We're back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Coming up, the Hillsdale Dialogue next hour with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. I'm joined now by Sung Min Kim of the Washington Post, ace reporter at the White House. She covers Congress as well. Good morning, Sung Min. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Can you believe that we went to 90 degrees this week? Honestly, I leave California and 90 degrees in humidity comes back. I just cannot believe Virginia sometimes. I just, I don't know about this place. <laughs> Sungman, you, um, you cover Congress pretty well. You know Senator Scott pretty well. Uh, one of the most decent, honest, generous hearted, sincere people I have ever met in the Congress. And he's under attack. Uh, by Joy Behar and all sorts of people. What is going on here? I did not expect that. I expected a lot of partisan clashing over taxes, but I did not expect a personal attack on Tim Scott. Well, a lot of it, uh, it's stemming from his uh, pretty well-received um, rebuttal to uh, President Biden's uh, joint session speech to Congress on Wednesday night. Uh, Tim Scott was selected by uh, the Republican leaders to deliver the GOP party's response to it. And I think one line that got a lot of or got a lot of attention was uh, Senator Scott's line that America is not a racist country. And I think um, and I think that's that, that's one particular line that's gotten a lot of attention. And Senator or um, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, responded to that the following day when she was doing a bunch of interviews. Um, and she was asked about that line and she said, um, she she also said that she, um, America is not you know inherently a racist country, but that um, but but that there are systemic problems, uh, systemic problems um, in in the systems of this country that needs to be solved. Um, so that's kind of the argument that many Democrats have been making. But obviously, as you 
point out um, there have been others who have been making the argument or who have been taking the argument a lot further. There have been offensive um, comments about Senator Scott that have been circulating on social media, um, and it's really kind of set off this uh, another kind of tense argument about race in America. And Sung Min, uh, tell us what you know of Senator Scott. I, I assume given your uh, 24-7 coverage of Congress for so long, you've had occasion to talk to him. I have. I, when he was first appointed, I went to a fundraiser for him in L.A. back before NBC Dears, and I could write checks, and I wrote him a check. I'm just blown away by the guy. Uh, what do you think of him? Right. He is, a, he is one of the members who is just really well-liked across the Republican conference and is deeply respected um, by leadership, by rank and file. Um, if you recall, during the 2017 tax debate, uh, he was tapped by McConnell um, along with other respected rank and file members, such as Rob Portman and Pat Toomey, as kind of one of the leaders of the tax overhaul in shaping that legislation that brought, obviously, um, that brought, obviously, the rest of the conference on board and uh, signed the 2017 tax legislation into, and got that into law. Um, obviously is very well respected as the point person for um, for the GOP when it comes to race issues. And they know um, he has he has earned a lot of trust within the conference. And they know that if he gets on board with a certain certain piece of legislation, that the rest of the conference can really go ahead and go along, which is why it's really important that he is the uh, he is the lead negotiator for Republicans right now on policing legislation. Um, he knows, uh, and for Republicans, you know, Senator Scott knows the problems that need to be fixed, but he knows uh, how to go not far enough. Um, so, and, and I think if there is a deal to be had with, um, you know, between, you know, Senator Scott and the De Democrats who are Cory Booker and Karen Bass on the Democratic side, they know that this will be a deal that Republicans can trust, which I think is a really valuable role in the conference. And I want to point out as well that, that Senator Scott has been uh, a sort of a, uh, a key uh, voice within the conference for when a nominee from the Republican side during the Trump year simply did not live up to the standard he expected on matters of race. He would not allow them to advance. I mean, his credentials are very solid. And so I put him now in, the, I moved him up to tier one, uh, in tier one for 2024 now. And this will change. It's very fluid. Is Chris Christie and Tom Cotton and Mike Pompeo and Ron DeSantis. And I moved up Tim Scott. I said, wow, that, that's a different kind. He's not as combative as the other four, but he's awfully persuasive. What do you think? So he uh, he has been talked about for national office occasionally um, because of his you know, sterling political talent and but obviously the the um, the speech Wednesday night kind of catapulted his profile even more and I believe he was asked about this uh, whether he would have presidential ambitions and he said that he hasn't even considered running for president of his homeowners association. Uh, I think president of the United States is obviously a more interesting job than leading your local HOA. But um, he hasn't been, obviously he has a political talent that has put him in the conversation. He hasn't been making kind of even quietly the type of political apparatus moves to build a network. For, to that would support a presidential campaign, but obviously he's going to be talked about for the next couple of years. Write it down. He's going to be on the ticket. Top or bottom. I said that about Kamala Harris about the same time in the cycle four years ago. He's going to be on the ticket. Sungman Kim, good to talk to you. I'll be right back, American.